It would seem that the world can only take one African crisis in at a time. Niger is now in sharp focus and Darfur has been knocked into the background. Yet the conflict between Arab militias believed to be backed by the Sudanese government and the rebel Sudanese Liberation Army has claimed at least 200,000 lives and scattered 2 million people from their homes, most of whom are still displaced people. Former BBC war reporter Martin Bell and one-time independent MP now has a new role as the UNICEF Ambassador for Humanitarian Emergencies. He's just led a delegation to Darfur and this is the film Newsnight asked him to make of his journey. If you think that if you stop looking at something it will go away, then think again and look again because it won't. The Abu Shuk camp near El Fasho in North Darfur is home of sorts to 57,000 people with another 22,000 in an overflow camp nearby. The numbers are still rising of people driven from their villages by the Arab militias, the Janjaweed, or who have fled from them in fear. Almost two million in Darfur with another 200,000 across the border in Chad. The government insists that people are now beginning to return to their homes. The evidence of our eyes contradicts that, as do the refugees themselves, like the tribal chiefs in Abu Shuk. To tell you the truth, as for return, I believe we will need many things which haven't happened yet, and actually may not be possible. How soon security will come, I've no idea. Ask the people who started the war. They're the ones who know if peace is near or not. When peace prevails, we'll need reconstruction and compensation as well. Compensate us for our assets, which were looted and burned. Only then shall we return to our villages. So along with all the other issues, drought, desertification, the legacy of the ethnic tensions, the terrible things that happened over those two and a half years, there is additionally an issue now of compensation. But at the heart of it all, at the heart of it all, lies security. What has happened in a year is that a temporary refuge has turned into a conurbation with brick walls in place around the plastic and canvas. The people needed a peace but got a war instead, needed a settlement but got only settlements. Keith McKenzie is UNICEF's man in Darfur. And look at these, look at these walls, this looks like a permanent township. You're absolutely right, it's getting a getting to look like a semi-permanent village, a large township almost. But I think that adds to the sense of security of the people who are living here. But it makes them more reluctant to leave. Makes back them to more the reluctant unknown, to. Yeah. True, true. So uh, when, when the time does come, um, I think we've, we've spoken to quite a few groups of people and they have just one prerequisite to going back home, and that's security. That's all that That's security. Them. That's yeah. all that's stopping them. Wells are being drilled 100, 200, even 300 feet deep with unknowable effects on the water table. Some of the early boreholes are already drying up, but the supply of water roots these people even more permanently in this territory. All hands to the pump. Here again is the paradox of the relief effort. Why should people go home when they have water in these camps but not in their villages? Food here but not there and above all, security here, but not there. There's a tremendous amount of insecurity. In fact, I think Darfur today is probably more, secu more insecure for the Indian community than it was a year ago. A year ago, the conflict was, to some extent, traditional conflict between military forces. What you're seeing in Darfur today is banditry. It's, it's anarchy, it's banditry, it's a total breakdown of law and order. So, in fact, it's a little more insecure for the humanitarian worker today in Darfur than it was a year ago. The delegation includes the actress Sophie Okonedo, star of the film Hotel Rwanda, and newest recruit to the UNICEF Supporters Club. A Londoner partly of Nigerian origin, she brings a fresh eye and understanding to the plight of these two million. I think when I've watched before um, on the news about people, people being displaced, I hadn't really got it that losing their land is like you know, losing part of their soul. And uh, it's so different for us in the West. We don't really understand that attachment to mm. the earth. And uh, I've been very moved by that. 
UNICEF has established child-friendly spaces here. They're needed. A million of Darfur's displaced are under 18. More than half a million are under five. Children with hope draw large images of peace, like flowers. Children in fear draw small images of war, like armored cars. After school, newly arrived children spoke to us about their experiences through a UNICEF interpreter. A helicopter came and shot at our village. We ran away and they stole everything. The Janjaweed came, they killed my father, they took everything and they led my brother away. They went to my aunt's house and stole her thermos flask, her radio and her earrings. My grandmother pleaded with them to let my aunt keep her earrings, but they said no. Later on, she called them bastards. It is a construction song. The children are singing about building up their camp. They get a better education here than they did in their villages. Another reason to stay. But is it their future to be permanent refugees? And is it Darfur's to be an African Gaza Strip on an epic scale? The answers depend on events beyond these tents. Our delegation is flown to rebel territory in a 20-year-old Russian helicopter chartered by the United Nations. Below us lie Abu Shuk and its satellite camp. More people to the square mile here than in Manhattan. It's just a short distance to the empty quarter, more like the empty three quarters or 99 hundredths of North Darfur. It is a harsh environment at the best of times, which this is not. Nothing lives here and nothing grows, except the numbers of displaced people. If fewer villages have been burned and abandoned this year than last, it is in part because there are fewer villages left to burn or abandon. We're heading northwest, across the ever southward creeping Sahara, to within 50 miles of the border with Chad. A ceasefire is in place, and on a good day, without sandstorms or skirmishes, UNICEF is licensed to travel from one side to the other. Welcome to Muzbat, a rebel-held stronghold, a place that redefines the middle of nowhere. Three years of drought and more than two of armed conflict are impacting on each other lethally. In a society where wealth is measured in livestock, animals are threatened first and then people. Thank you for, thank you for coming. Solomon Jamus has traveled through the night to meet us. It's safer that way, he says. Described as the humanitarian coordinator of the Sudan Liberation Army, he is more than that. He's a politician, and the soldiers defer to him. He sets out the rebels' demands, the disbanding of the Janjaweed, the sharing of wealth and power, and the bringing of war criminals to justice. We are not uh, keen to, to continue uh, fighting, but what we need is this true peace achieved by the... By the, by the by the international community, uh, community and guarded by the international community. And uh, we, are, uh, we took uh, weapons because we were marginalized and we were uh, about to be smashed out of our area. And we defended ourselves to this stage. And now the, the world is aware of our uh, problem and we need them to, hold, uh, to solve the problem. But they, uh, they should know that since the Janjaweed and this power, this government is still in power, it is very difficult to achieve peace in Darfur. Another day, another flight. This one on a UN Beechcraft to Niala, capital of the south. We're on a mission to meet the governor, Khartoum's man in Darfur. The landscape below is the scene of some serious ceasefire violations. SLA ambushes provoke massive government counter-strikes and still more people are displaced. The Otesh camp outside Niala is home to 27,000 of them. And Kalma, which last year held 50,000, now holds 150,000. The biggest refugee camp in the world. I had the honor to meet you a year ago. And it is an honor to 
be received by you again. But the business is the peace process and the governor is unexpectedly positive. I think the situation is very good now. Uh, and I think also the humanitarian situation is improving. And there is a good effort, uh, what was done by UNICEF and the other NGOs, uh, so that to protect uh, children. And I think within two or three months, uh, all the situation in the south of Darfur uh, will be, uh, and all Darfur will be, inshallah, very, very good. Thank you very much for your visit. Much depends on the African Union deploying here on its first ever full peacekeeping mission. It has 3,000 men on the ground, increasing by the end of next month to 7,500, including three battalions from Nigeria and three from Rwanda with strong support from South Africa. That's not much in a territory the size of France, but it has started well and includes a contingent of civil police to reassure the displaced people in the camps. Even in Africa, things don't always go from bad to worse. And the Nigerian commander is a living symbol of reconciliation. 38 years ago, he fought on the losing side in his country's civil war. Well, this, I would say the chances are 70%, 80% chances of success in this mission. And I think if we are able to get the troops, we are able to get the equipment, we should be able to succeed. One last journey to the rebel enclave in the moonscape of the Jebel Mara Mountains north of Niala. They're short of everything here, food, water, and above all, peace. Tough, tough territory, huh? Yes, tough territory. And they're really suffering. Yeah, because uh, all it is too difficult. What they do have is a small clinic, again, uniquely supplied by UNICEF. Because of such attacks, and they were treated in this place. So this is the nearest thing to a field hospital you have? Exactly. That's all you have? Exactly. The medicines can come in by helicopter, but the food aid can only be delivered by airdrops, and there's no sign of that. Mm -hmm. Yet the people here surprised us. Here they were in the heart of Africa, in the midst of their own struggle for survival, expressing sympathy with the British people. We condemn the bombings that took place in London and extend our condolences to all the victims. All of us here, leaders and people alike, want to say to your people that we feel your pain as we too have experienced the killing of innocent people among us, in our case by the Janjaweed. <laughs> the visit ends at another of the children's play spaces. And there are things that UNICEF ambassadors do, which report is cut. Some of these children are orphans. Many are refugees. All are at increasing risk from the war and the drought around them. They do not deserve and cannot afford a future like their past. Back near the camp, it is late afternoon. The women left early in the morning to gather firewood for cooking or for bartering. Two of them have babies on their backs. They have walked some 14 miles for these bundles of twigs and some grasses. Their daily hardship would be, for most people, unendurable. Darfur remains the world's greatest humanitarian crisis, Niger and the tsunami region included. It is beginning to look perpetual. The suffering in these camps, now in its second year, is a standing, searing, scathing indictment of the evil which made it happen and of the indifference which let it happen, and still does. Martin Bell and Darfur. It's these people even more permanently in this territory. All hands to the pump. Here again is the paradox of the relief effort. Why should people go home when they have water in these camps but not in their villages, food here but not there, and above all, security here but not there.
There's a tremendous amount of insecurity. In fact, I think Darfur today is probably more, secu more insecure for the Indian community than it was a year ago. A year ago, the conflict was, to some extent, traditional conflict between military forces. What you're seeing in Darfur today is banditry. It's, it's anarchy, it's banditry, it's a total breakdown of law and order. So, in fact, it's a little more insecure for the humanitarian worker today in Darfur than it was a year ago. The delegation includes the actress Sophie Okanedo, star of the film Hotel Rwanda, and newest recruit to the UNICEF Supporters Club. A Londoner partly of Nigerian origin, she brings a fresh eye and understanding to the plight of these two million. I think when I've watched before um, on the news about people, people being displaced, I hadn't really got it. It would seem that the world can only take one African crisis in at a time. Niger is now in sharp focus and Darfur has been knocked into the background. Yet the conflict between Arab militias believed to be backed by the Sudanese government and the rebel Sudanese Liberation Army has claimed at least 200,000 lives and scattered 2 million people from their homes, most of whom are still displaced people. Former BBC war reporter Martin Bell and one-time independent MP now has a new role as the UNICEF Ambassador for Humanitarian Emergencies. He's just led a delegation to Darfur and this is the film Newsnight asked him to make of his journey. If you think that if you stop looking at something it will go away, then think again and look again because it won't. The Abu Shuk camp near El Fasho in North Darfur is home of sorts to 57,000 people with another 22,000 in an overflow camp nearby. The numbers are still rising of people driven from their villages by the Arab militias, the Janjaweed, or who have fled from them in fear. Almost two million in Darfur with another 200,000 across the border in Chad. The government insists that people are now beginning to return to their homes. The evidence of our eyes contradicts that, as do the refugees themselves, like the tribal chiefs in Abu Shuk. To tell you the truth, as for return, I believe we will need many things which haven't happened yet, and actually may not be possible. How soon security will come, I've no idea. Ask the people who started the war. They're the ones who know if peace is near or not. When peace prevails, we'll need reconstruction and compensation as well. Compensate us for our assets, which were looted and burned. Only then shall we return to our villages. So along with all the other issues, drought, desertification, the legacy of the ethnic tensions, the terrible things that happened over those two and a half years, there is additionally an issue now of compensation. But at the heart of it all, at the heart of it all, lies security. That losing their land is like you know, losing part of their soul. And uh, it's so different for us in the West. We don't really understand that attachment to the earth. And uh, I've been very moved by that. UNICEF has established child-friendly spaces here. They're needed. A million of Darfur's displaced are under 18. More than half a million are under five. Children with hope draw large images of peace, like flowers. Children in fear draw small images of war, like armoured cars. After school, newly arrived children spoke to us about their experiences through a UNICEF interpreter. A helicopter came and shot at our village. We ran away and they stole everything. The Janjawi came, they killed my father, they took everything, and they led my brother away. What has happened in a year is that a temporary refuge has turned into a conurbation with brick walls in place around the plastic and canvas. The people needed a peace, but got a war instead needed a settlement, but got only settlements. Keith McKenzie is UNICEF's man in Darfur. And look at these, look at these walls. This looks like a permanent township. You're absolutely right. It's getting, a, getting to look like a semi-permanent village, a large township almost. 
But I think that adds to the sense of security of the people who are living here. But it makes them more reluctant to leave. Makes them more the reluctant unknown, to yeah. true, true. So uh, yeah, when when the time nice. does come, um, I think we we've, we've spoken oh, yeah, to quite yeah. a few groups of people, and they have just one prerequisite to going back home, and that's security. That's all. That that's stops security. Them. That's yeah. all that's stopping them. Wells are being drilled 100, 200, even 300 feet deep with unknowable effects on the water table. Some of the early boreholes are already drying up, but the supply of water...